Let's go ahead and open our Bibles then to 11th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Uh, We made it down to verse 33 the last time we're together. That's where we'll pick it up tonight. Luke's Gospel, chapter 11. And Lord willing, we'll put a wrap on uh, chapter 11 tonight. Uh, Now, I think in the in the Western world that, that we, we can entertain in our minds a kind of a caricature of, of who Jesus was during his earthly ministry. We have, we have a kind of almost cartoon Jesus, right? We tend to think, well, uh, you know, Jesus, pretty much all-around nice guy. He, he patted children on the head. And, uh, he told us to love each other. He, he certainly said, never said anything harsh or angry to anybody. Uh, And yet those who subscribe uh, to such a picture of Christ, they do not have an understanding of the Jesus of the Bible. Now, he was a nice guy to be sure. I mean, that's an understatement. But of course, he was infinitely more than that. He was God in the flesh, which means he is totally other, totally holy, uh, utterly holy. And now the Jesus that we are going to see in these next sections of Scripture here is going to challenge our view of Christ. We're going to see a very aggressive Jesus. He he is going to be very pointed and and, and very sharp. He is really going to get after these religious leaders now uh, in a fashion that you and I might consider uh, very harsh. Now, uh, the reason for this shift is in large part... Uh, the transition we saw the last time we were together. You remember that that Jesus lobbed um, one more invitation over into the court of the Pharisees, and, and yet they remained steadfast in their rejection of Christ. And so what we've seen to this point is really a um, Jesus warning and and bringing forth exhortation and, and invitation uh, at this point uh, to these men, uh, and yet with now the rejection, with their rejection of Christ having come now to full maturity, we're going to see a real shift here from invitation to now denunciation. They have dug in their heels. And so really the only thing left to do uh, for Christ concerning these re- religious leaders, these Pharisees, is to now denounce their teachings, to deconstruct them, to break them down and show them for what they are, and that is absolute hypocrisy. Now, the reason for the aggression, uh, because understand, these guys are already gone, all right? They have left the reservation. They have taken the short bus to stupid town. And, and in fact, Jesus is going to call them that, actually, in, in the text tonight, in, in, in a manner of speaking. But, but really, the reason for the aggression now is not because they themselves have left the reservation, but because they are now seeking, through their power and influence over the people, to bring as many people off the reservation with them, if you will. And, and Jesus is not all too happy about that um, one bit. Now, again, remember that these leaders have gone on record to say, if you believe that this guy is from God, then you are in opposition to us. We are of the opinion that he is of Satan. So understand that if you believe that this guy of God, if you believe that this guy is of God, then we are going to run you out of the synagogue. We're going to kick you out of church. Now, for you and I, we have so many choices, do we not, uh, concerning where it is we fellowship? You don't like the Baptists? Well. You've got the Methodists or the Presbyterians or the Lutherans or or a a number of non-denoms. You throw a heavy stone around here, you're going to break a stained glass window somewhere, all right? There really is no end to the choices that you and I have as far as Christian expression uh, in Christian, uh, Christian worship go. But in the first century, understand that the synagogue was the only game in town. And if you did not go there, you did not go anywhere. And so your social life your professional life, certainly your spiritual life, it all revolved around you being in good standing with those who were in charge of the synagogue. And so for you to be cast out of the synagogue, that was a very 
a very serious line that you were crossing. And so uh, now because of the threat being brought forth by uh, the leadership, the people are now being manipulated. They are coming under a kind of a power play on the part of the religious established in Israel. And, and again, Christ is not happy about that one bit. Now, uh, Christ will begin tonight uh, teaching about the light. He, of course, said, I am the light of the world. He'll start out teaching about the light, but then he is going to press very hard into these Pharisees, and he is going to give you an eye the seven marks of religious hypocrisy. What, what, what does religious hypocrisy look like in the life of an individual? And, and as we get through that, uh, again, I, I told our church yesterday, I, I want to be uh, the kind of pastor that they are thankful for in eternity. I, I don't want them getting there and saying, why didn't he warn us? I mean, what, why did he pass over the tough in favor of the fluff? And so just a heads up, this is going to get tough tonight, but, but I want us to see this as a sweet conviction. We'll get to that. But, but as we get through this, I want us to ask this of the Lord tonight. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if I left my cell phone on. Uh, But see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. As we get through this, uh, let us ask God to search our hearts. Do we see any traces of these marks within our own hearts? Is there any kind of uh, residual affectation uh, of religious hypocrisy uh, kind of imprinted upon our own hearts? Ultimately, that we might ask God to root that out. Are you tracking? So, so look, understand, my toes are, this week, are, are getting pinched. My, my toes are being pinched right alongside yours. And, and I say bring it, all right? I want to get closer to my Lord. So ultimately understand, that's what this is all about. That's why we are here. This is an invitation that God is laying out before you and I to come closer to the heart of Christ. This is not condemnation. Hear that. This is not condemnation. This is conviction. This is invitation. Blessed, beautiful, sweet invitation that we might be made more and more into the the image of, of Christ from glory to glory. God is so Good. So let's get after it then. Uh, And Christ, the light of the world himself, of course, Christ now on the subject of light, verse 33. No one after lighting a lamp puts it away in a cellar nor under a basket, but on the lampstand so that those who, uh, so that those who enter may see the light. The eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is clear, your whole body is also uh, also is full of light, but when it is bad, your body is also full of darkness. Now watch verse 35. Watch out, or, and this is an emphatic word in the Greek, by the way, you might have be careful, uh, you might have take heed. I think the NIV has see to it there, uh, but this is a, a strong word. Then watch out that the light in you, watch this, is not darkness. Watch out that the light in you is not darkness. So, there are false lights. If, therefore, your whole body is full of light, with no dark part in it, it will be wholly illumined, as when the lamp illumines you with its rays. Now, we don't have to get um, super lofty and and philosophical with this. I, I have read and heard Uh, just some crazy sermons on this text over the years. Look, uh, let's keep it simple. Jesus is saying that you and I use light. All right, we, we use light to our advantage, to our benefit. When you walk into a dark room, do you turn on the light to make things harder for yourself? You know, do you turn on the light to make things more difficult for you? No, you do not. You turn on the light so you don't fall over and break your neck. You turn on the light so that you can see. You turn on the light that you might use the light to protect yourself from 
harm. When the eyeball is working correctly, light waves are coming into the eyeball, and the eyeball is then sending those messages onto the brain, and then the brain is then giving direction to the rest of the body. Now watch out. You know, there, there's a couch here. In my case, it's watch out. There's 47 little die-cast metal cars on the floor, and, you know, you step on enough Hot Wheels on your way to sneak pie in the middle of the night, you learn to use the light to protect yourself. Here, the idea is that the body is being directed in, in this context now by the quality of the light. The, the, not just the light, but the quality of the light is in view here. Christ is saying the light has come, and the light has come for your benefit, to protect you from spiritual harm. It is the quality of the light that is in view, and the context here is false teaching. Mark's what he, uh, Mark what he says in uh, verse 35. Be very careful there. A- again, emphatic in the Greek. Watch out that the light that you are letting in is not darkness. And in other words, make sure that whatever it is that you are attaching yourself to, make sure that is the truth. There are a lot of false lights in the world. Now, never has there been a time uh, where we are being inundated with false... Te- we are literally under a siege of false teaching in our day. And so this really couldn't be more timely. In fact, the Apostle Paul, prophesying of the day in which you and I live, said this to Timothy. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine about wanting to have their ears tickled, They will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. And so listen, do you understand that there are a lot of false lights out there? Yes, even on the Christian bestseller list. So you need to make sure that, hey, is what I am allowing to come in here, is what I am allowing to be a kind of guiding factor in my life, is it true? And there are, the criterion are two, twofold. Is this the word of God? And is this leading me to delight in Christ? Those are the two primary questions right there. Is this the word of God, and is it leading me to delight in Christ? But, and what we'll see here, if it is the tradition of men, and it is leading you to delight in yourself, see the difference? Is it the word of God? Is it leading to delight in Christ? But, if it is the tradition of men, and it is leading you to delight in yourself, well then, biblically speaking, you are barking up the wrong tree, my friend. And that is exactly what Christ is now going to run into here. And so coming on the scene then, uh, now, uh, is this very, very, very religious guy. One of the chief false lights that you and I have to contend with today is the false light of religion. Verse 37. Now when he had spoken, a Pharisee asked him to have lunch with him. And he went in, and he reclined at the table. Now, now understand, this invitation is not chummy, all right? Uh, This is nothing more than a box trap being set for Christ. Again, remember, Christ had already pronounced judgment upon this group last week. But again, you got to love Jesus, never one to turn down a meal, right? Verse 38, uh, when the Pharisee saw it, he was surprised. Uh, he, he was shocked. He was blown away. Okay, a, a very strong word here. When he saw it, well, when he saw what? That he, being Jesus, had not first ceremonially washed before the meal. Jesus didn't wash his hands. And so moms and dads, when your child sits down at the dinner table tomorrow night or at lunch tomorrow and with filthy hands and you ask, what do you think you are doing? If they're paying attention, uh, they could say, well, uh, being just like Jesus Christ, mom. And so this Pharisee now, he sees Jesus walk in the room and go straight to the table to sit down. And he does this deliberately, okay? He's picking a fight, okay? So Jesus walks in the room, goes straight to the table. And notice, this guy doesn't say anything. He's not speaking to Christ here. Jesus will read his mind. But he is looking at this, and Luke tells us he is just beside himself. Oh, my. Oh, my. Jesus has not washed his hands, right? 
Uh, you you got to understand that these guys were the fathers of OCD, okay, particularly as it relates to hygiene. So I, I'm telling you, man, I, I hope God's got this on TiVo. I, I think this guy is looking at this and he's going, I, 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 he's having a very difficult time with it. Now, now you have to remember that, that much of the law of God dealt with hygiene, Okay, you have to understand contextually at the time that the law of God came to the Jews, you had millions of people coming out of Egypt living in these very primitive conditions. And, and so, uh, therefore, if infectious disease was to take hold under those conditions, it could spread very rapidly and destroy God's people. So much of the law dealt with, well, well this is how you deal with solid waste. All right, This is what you do with a dead body. This is what you do when you've dealt with somebody with an, an infectious disease. This is how long you quarantine people for. Okay? Now, the Jews, they then took this very simple law of God and they began to expound upon it. They began to, and boy, did they ever expound upon it. Understand, that's what religion does religion increases regulation. One of the things that they expounded upon was the washing of hands. The, the washing of hands was a big deal in rabbinic Judaism. And, and if you did not wash your hands according to the precise way in which they proclaimed, you were considered to be just a great and awful and terrible sinner. Now, in the Mishnah, what's the Mishnah? The Mishnah was the Jewish rabbinic commentary on the law of God. And in, in, in the Mishnah, get this, they had four chapters. And it's called the Yadayim, this particular section in the Mishnah. They had four chapters, 22 paragraphs in all, that dealt solely with their prescribed means of washing hands. I, I spent an hour or so uh, reading through this stuff this week. It, it, it's pretty it, it, insane. Let me share some of this with you. For example, the Mishnah said... Um, the amount of water that should be poured over the hands should be equal to the liquid contents of six eggs. Uh, all right. I, that kind of surprised me because we use more than that, right? Uh, but it said, no one may pour water over the hands of their neighbor out of cupped hands lest they be defiled. So, so to be very clear, you know, you're on the job site and your buddy says, hey, man, throw some water over here. No, no, I can't do that. And it must come from a very specific kind of vessel. The, the, the vessel itself needs to meet a number of regulations. For example, you could not use, quote, unquote here, a vessel that a dead reptile had fallen into. Not sure what that's all about. Evidently, there were a number of chameleons in that culture. I don't know. But, but the vessel itself, all kinds of regulations there. Of course, there could be no chip or crack at the top of the vessel or on the sides of the lid. You had to make sure there were no cracks or even dings in this deal because we all know how angry God gets over these kinds of things. Now, not only is it important what kind of a vessel you and I pour out of or, or they poured out of, uh, but it's also important on who poured it out. The Mishnah said, quote, All are fit to pour water over the hands, even a deaf mute or an imbecile. Well, that's comforting. So if I'm an idiot, I can wash my hands. Thank you, Rabbi. Lucky for me. All right? Here's one I found puzzling. All are fit to pour water over the hands. Even, see, I'm not making this stuff up, okay? Uh, or an imbecile or a minor. A minor may place a barrel between his knees or turn the barrel on its side and pour it out. An ape... An ape may pour out water over the hands, although Rabbi Yosse declares that these latter two cases are invalid. So, so uh, let me get this straight. If, if I've got a trained monkey and I want to use the monkey to wash my hands, I can do that. But we, we've got conflict among the rabbis. Uh, do you see how crazy trained these guys were? I mean, look, but j just the, the minutia that religion creates, it just drives you crazy is what it does. Sarah and I, um, the kids love Menards for whatever reason, and they really like the Christmas section. Happy holidays. Season's greetings. Just checking to see if any of you get in the nosebleed. We'll get to that. 
I read this week about the Church of England, how a couple of years ago, they started a campaign called Christmas Starts with Christ. And, you know, we get that a play on the word uh, Christmas. And, and I get it. They were trying to get the people of, of Great Britain back to the idea that Christmas is all about Christ. So far, so good. But then they came up with this doll that they called the God Baby. And this is the poster that they plastered all over England. God Baby. He cries. He wees. And he even saves the world. Just look at that for a minute. It's a little creepy. I mean, do we understand how stupid religion can get at times? What is that going to accomplish? All right? And, And so understand, we might not be as maniacal as the Pharisees were here, but we can get a little bit goofy from time to time, and Christmas is one of those times that you and I can get our religion on, all right? Now, look, you're, you're doing some Christmas shopping, and some retail clerk says, uh, you know, and they're just being nice, you know, hey, happy holidays there. You know, they're not violating the law of God. You're just, you're at Target or Kohl's or whatever, and hey, hey, happy holidays, and, and it's, what? Did you say happy holidays? It's, it's, it's Merry Christmas. Christ, Christ, Christ. <laughs> I mean, we, look, man, pick your battles, all right? We, we can get wound up pretty tight over this stuff, and I'm not convinced that it draws people to the gospel, and you can get so militant you're actually pushing people away. Uh, again, here's my email. Uh, you know, uh, if a couple of you want to rip into me, you're, you're welcome to write that down. Um, and so understand, um, yeah, you're not supposed to see it. It's supposed to be smaller. <laughs> it is, understand, it is the stupidity of religion that Christ is, is confronting here. He has a man that is all upset. Why? Because he has violated the word of God? No, but because he has violated their traditions. Now, again, where Jesus goes from here is that Christ is going to be talking about the marks of hypocrisy, and he gives us seven of them. Understand that religion has the capacity, the ability to lead you and I into a kind of hypocritical lifestyle that, again, does little more than push people away from the kingdom of God. Now, number one, we've already got the first mark of religious hypocrisy is elevating the tradition of men over the word of God. When we are judging others and when we are dealing with others using the standards of men and the traditions of men rather than the Bible, we got a problem. This man is upset because Jesus dares to challenge their traditions. And and I would guess, more times than not, when a person with a a kind of religious bent is upset at you, it's not because they can go to chapter and verse in the Scripture. Okay? But it's because of some uh, religious hang-up they have concerning you. you. How it is that you dress, how often you take communion, whether or not you're wearing a hat in church and and these kinds of things. And so uh, it is the idea that we are being judged not by what the Bible says, Purdue, but according to man's standards. That's number one. I I baited a bunch of Michigan fans and said, see, you're a hypocrite. Yesterday, it was awesome. It's not going to work with you guys. All right, lead balloon. All right. I'm good with that. So it is this idea that we are not being judged by what the Bible says, but by man's standards. That's number one. Number two, then, Jesus' response in verse 39. But the Lord said to him, and again, this guy didn't speak, but the Lord said to him, now you Pharisees clean the outside, underline outside, you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but Inside of you, you are full of robbery and wickedness, you foolish ones. Now, that word foolish there, uh, I'm telling you, you go look this up in Strong's Greek Dictionary, okay? And it says, properly mindless, that is, stupid. It's what it says, okay? Uh, You foolish ones, did not he who made the outside make the inside also, but give that which is within as charity, and then all things are clean 
for you. Now, again, there is no indication that this guy is speaking here. Uh, I would imagine being a, a mind reader would, would come with a few advantages. Christ knows his thoughts here. And, and that's what we saw last week in the text in verse 17, right? That not only does Christ know the, the thoughts that we have, but he knows why we are having them. Okay, he knows why, not only what we are thinking, but why we are thinking. It, uh, the Bible says in uh, Hebrews 4, uh, 13, that, that all is naked and open and bare before him with whom we have to do. Uh, imagine what it, it would have been like to be in a conversation with Christ in the room. You're talking to him. Imagine all of a sudden, how did he know that? I, I, I didn't even say anything. Awesome. Now, it seems fantastical, and yet how often does that very thing happen when we sit under the teaching of the Word of God? I can't tell you how many times people will say, man, I'll tell you what, the Word just spoke straight to my own heart. Did you write this sermon for me? I mean, were you crawling around inside my head this week? And, And I say, well, no, but evidently God was. Listen, Christ is still alive, okay? He is called the Word of God. And the Bible says, you back up a verse to Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is alive and active and living. And so in a sense, we don't have to wonder what it's like. Christ is speaking to you and I right here, right now, in His Word, if you have eyes to see and ears to hear. So, Let's continue to see what it is he has for us. Now, one of the things about hypocrites uh, is that they put the focus on the outward. Okay, that is their focus. That is what is important to them. It's important that I look the part, all right? It's important that people see me in that part. And, And that is the difference between biblical Christianity and the hypocrisy of religion. Now, here we are, we're sitting in a church building and Maybe we look all spiffy, and that's, that's all well and good. But what is it that God is most interested in, right? God is interested most in what is within. God, God is interested in the heart, okay? Uh, of what benefit possibly could there be to you and I dressing up the outward, being in the right building, singing the right songs, if, in fact, our hearts are not gauged in a kind of active pursuit of God. How are we advantaged? How is God pleased? Well, we're not, and and, and he isn't. Now, religion says, and of course, this is the difference between Christianity and every single religion in the world. The religions of the world say, scream even, conform. You take your outward man and you conform to our program. You conform to our principles. You conform to our expression of worship. You check off our list of to-dos before God. You you conform the outward and then God will look upon you and be pleased. Biblical Christianity says, no, no. Where it begins is this. There is a great gulf that exists between you and a holy God, and there is nothing you could ever do to bridge that gulf. The the preeminent point of the Old Testament law was to show man that he could never bridge that gulf. But somebody was coming who could, that someone being Christ. He came and lived the perfect, sinless life in both thought and deed, and he became your bridge to God. We must never tire of the gospel. We must never move off of the gospel, lest one day we find ourselves swimming yet again in the waters of religion. We can somehow forget that Christ has done it all. When he went to that cross, he took his wrath-absorbing, perfect life to death so that you and I in our imperfection might live. And all we got to do is take him up on that trade. Yeah, you got to choose that. God didn't want robots. But understand, the gospel is the absolute antidote to religion. Christ has kept the whole law for you, so the unbearable, soul-crushing burden of religion could be lifted from you. 
Don't ever get off that fact. Look at the gospel. Stare at the gospel. Turn it like a fine prism, seeing every reflection you can. Deepen your understanding of the mystery of the gospel. Don't move off it or you'll get religious. Romans chapter 1. From faith to faith, the just shall live by faith. Not from faith to works. This is a warning for for mature Christians, I mean, it's easy to get off of the gospel and find yourself all of a sudden in a sea of works before you know it. It's very subtle. Now, back to the text. The, the moment that we put our trust in Christ, the Bible says his spirit takes up residency in our heart. And what does his spirit do? Back to the text. His spirit begins to change us, uh, dial in from the inside outward, not the other way around. Okay, biblical Christianity is not about, all right, I'm going to come into a religious building. I'm going to say some religious things, and and, and somehow I'm just going to be different. No, no. You confess Christ. He then imparts his divine nature upon you, and his spirit begins to challenge you. His spirit begins to not condemn, but convict you, and you are being changed from the inside out hypocrisy likes to dress up on the outside and doesn't really care what's going on on the inside. Why do we read of so many pastors and priests uh, molesting children and getting into sexual trouble? It's not rocket science. All right, the outside is all dressed up, but inwardly they're just as greedy, they're just as angry, they're just as lustful as anybody else because the outside has been changed, but there's no heart change. This is the second mark of religious hypocrisy, a focus upon the outward. For you note takers, mark number two, a focus upon the outward, the external. And Christ has said very pointedly here, very pointedly in the original language, if you think the outward is going to impress God, then you are, as the text says, properly mindless. That is stupid. That's number two. Look, I didn't write this stuff. Number three, then, verse 42. But woe to you, Pharisees, for you pay tithe of mint and rue and in every kind of garden herb, and yet disregard justice and the love of God. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. The the Jews had um, a number of tithes in the Old Testament. If you were to add all of them up, you'd be slightly over around 23%, one of those tithes or tenths, one of those tithes, if you will, um, was upon their crops. This was an agrarian culture. Now here again, these guys took this down and just drilled it down to the minutia here. You were hardly expected to consider your little personal home garden as a crop producing enterprise. All right. Uh, The law was not intended um, to be inclusive of that unless, of course, you were a Pharisee. Christ is saying to these guys, look, you take these teeny, weeny, little herb seeds, right? you, you take these tiny seeds, and you bother to count them out. Nine for me, one for God. Nine for me, one for... I mean, you talk about being committed to the insignificant. These people were committed to it. The third mark of religion, note takers, the third mark of religion is placing great importance upon the insignificant. Now, notice he says, you know, you're tithing all of that. You're, you're drilling this idea down to an inconceivably insignificant level, and yet you've blown off the big guns, man. You've blown off justice, and you have blown off the love of God. And again, man, that's just what religion does. It produces a boatload of meaningless regulation, and all of that produces is just a tearing away of our attention from that which ought to be most important in life. You know, I found myself... Uh, running up against um, what's called the Hebrew Roots Movement again this past week. A a friend of mine, I've had a few run-ins with this, a friend of mine sent me this post 
uh, that kept showing up on his Facebook feed from uh, an old client of his, and, and his radar was right on. I love you, VXV people. He said, I, I'm a simple man, but have these nuts just dispensed with the New Testament? And so I gave him some guidance there. Uh, but there's a lot of different groups within uh, that, that kind of fly under the banner of this Hebrew roots movement, but essentially it's a very... Uh, hyper religious movements uh, movement where its adherents uh, essentially think that they have to go back and become Old Testament Jews to live right before God, and so they dress like them and they they talk like them, and and much of their teaching denigrates really whole sections of the New Testament, particularly the Pauline epistles. And so they're very big on using uh, the old Hebrew terminology. God is not God, but he is Yahweh, and Jesus is Yeshua. I, I remember many, many years ago, about 20 years ago as a, a new Christian, I, I'm trying to, to find my way around, around this weird new world called Christianity. And, and I'll never forget this. Uh, this guy said to me one day, you know, um, I I'm not sure I, I can continue to really fellowship with you. You just keep using the name Jesus. He was all caught up. I didn't know this then, but he was all caught up in this Hebrew roots movement. Now, the Hebrew is Yeshua. The Greek is Jesus. Jesus. The English is Joshua. I didn't know that then, but, but I had enough sense to say, do you mean to tell me that when Yeshua sits in yonder heaven... And I cry out, oh, Jesus, save me. Uh, Do you mean to tell me that Christ is going to say, well, you know, I'd like to help you and all, but I can't really do that. No, if you would have used Yeshua, then I might have thrown you a bone or two. Needless to say, he had no desire to further fellowship with me. But again, people, they they hang on to the most insignificant things. And and again, that's what religion does. It it entangles a person in a a kind of sticky uh, web of insignificance. And it's really hard to free yourself from that. Some of the conversations that you will have with, with religious people, it just leaves you scratching your head. Why in the world is this... So important to this brother. We get all caught up in the dumbest things. Now now think about this. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is being butchered all around the world. Believers are being killed for their faith, even as I stand here speaking tonight. But here we are in the Western world. And of course, we have more time than the average Christian in the world. And we, well, we generally have more money than the average Christian in the world. And and so we got time and we've got money. And so we can kind of uh, explore some of these things and and we can debate and we can argue and we can fight. And what can happen is we can just begin to lose touch with what is really important. We can, as Christ says here, forget about justice, just forget about doing right by people. And we can forget about really the most important thing, the love of God. And so for you and I today, it's not about holding all your little pet doctrines over the people of God like a hammer. It is about loving God and delighting in God and that delight then producing a real love for people. If getting all wrapped up and fired up over the insignificant, if that becomes what you're all about, well then Jeff Foxworthy might say, you might be a religious hypocrite, right? You all know who he is? A focus, we'll get back to him later. A focus upon the insignificant, that's mark number three. Fourth mark then, verse 43. Woe to you, Pharisees, uh, for you love the chief seats in the synagogues and the respectful greetings in the marketplaces. Religious hypocrisy, it desires the attention of others. That's number four. It wants to be noticed. I want you to think that I pray more than I do. I would like you to think that I read my Bible more than I do. In fact, I love what we do with social media and this type of, you know, just get my Bible. Wait, I got to turn to Revelation. The coffee cup just right. Boom, out to the world. I would like you to think that I'm a nicer person than I really am. And so we put on this kind of veneer, 
this kind of facade and all we're doing is play acting. If you find yourself pretending to have it all together, well, I love you, but that's just dumb. Because when you're pretending, when you are pretending, when you are play acting, all you are accomplishing is robbing the body of Christ of what it is she is meant to be to you, and that is a tangible expression of God's mercy and God's grace and God's forgiveness and his encouragement. Again, all is laid bare before God. God sees your heart, but religious hypocrisy doesn't care about that. Religious hypocrisy is is only concerned with looking the part. Now, number five might be the worst of them all, verse 44. Woe to you. Now, in many of the original manuscripts, uh, King Jimmy captures this. It will say, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Okay? Okay. Um, some of your translations don't have that. Uh, that th- this will become very evident in the context of verse 45. But So, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for you are like, underline this, concealed tombs. You might have unmarked graves in your translation. For you are like unmarked graves, and the people who walk over them are unaware of it. Very powerful imagery here. I'm going to take a bit of unpacking. Now, when he says concealed tombs or unmarked graves, he's talking about a kind of roadside, um, roadside cave or a roadside grave. Here, here, here's the context. In that culture, they did not have um, the roadside conveniences that you and I enjoy today. There were not restaurants and stores or or hotels at, at, at many of their uh, interchanges. So, uh, for example, let's say here you are, uh, you and your family, your first century Jews, you're, you're going to travel to uh, 100, 120 miles or so to Jerusalem for the Passover. You're about halfway there, and you see this heavy storm front coming in, and, and so uh, y- y- you're too far along to turn around. And so what you would do is you would find a nearby cave that you and your family could take shelter in. In until the storm passed. Now, the problem is that a number of these caves would be used as grave sites. Okay? And so you would get in out from the weather and you'd get in your family in the cave only to discover once you're inside that this particular cave is being used to bury the dead. So now you've got a problem because according to the law of God, Numbers chapter 19, you would be defiled for being in that cave. You were ceremonially unclean for seven days. You can't go to the Passover. And so what they would do is they were supposed to mark the outside of the caves. Hey, don't come in here. This cave is being used to bury the dead. Jesus is saying to these guys, you are like an unmarked grave. You have people that are unwittingly buying into what it is that you are selling and you're corrupting them. You are defiling them. And understand the imagery is very deliberate here. Christ is saying the direction that you are leading people in is the path that ends in the grave. You are with your religion ushering people unwittingly unto death and they don't even know it. Are you catching this? Now, I think the very real uh, and very sober warning for you and I is when unbelieving people see you and I living hypocritically, all that produces is a souring of their hearts towards the things of God. One of the most frequent responses that you will hear an an unbelieving person say why it is that they don't believe. One one of the most frequent responses you'll hear is that, look, I I know a lot of people that go to church and and they're just hypocrites. I, I, I don't need that. When we are living hypocritical lives, we might just be like these guys here, unwittingly pointing people in the direction of the graveyard. The fifth mark of religious hypocrisy and easily the most damaging is when you are corrupting others. All right? When you are infecting others. With that which you are corrupted with already yourself. 
And it's why we need to be praying that God would remove religious hypocrisy far from us. Now, uh, let's, let's, verse 45, let's read this. Cracks me up here. Verse 45. Again, uh, one of the lawyers, the scribes, lawyers, one of the lawyers said to him in reply, Teacher, when you say this, you insult us too. Now again, remember the top of verse 44. King Jimmy grabbed it. It's Pharisees and scribes. You remember these scribes? We met a couple of them. These guys are the lawyers. And so verse 45, it's, Hey, are are you lumping us in with these guys? You talking to me? I mean, is that what you're doing here? Are you talking about me? Oh, you bet I am, Christ says, verse 46. Uh, but he said, Woe to you lawyers as well, for you weigh men down with burdens hard to bear, while you yourselves will not even touch the burden uh, burdens with one of your fingers. Mark number six, then, hypocrisy makes life harder. That's what he's saying to these lawyers here. They are not making living for God and, and living before God and, and just living out your faith any easier. So, so here is Jesus. Yeah, I'm talking about you and I'm talking to you because you put all of this stuff on the Lord's people and you don't help them carry it one single bit. Well, Christ is not done. Verse 47. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets... And it was your fathers who killed them. So you are witnesses and, and approve the deeds of your fathers because it was they who killed them and you build their tomb. So, so these guys that you honor, these guys that you revered, do you, you do understand your fathers killed these guys, right? Verse 49. For this reason, also the wisdom of God said, I will send to them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill, and some they will persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets, and this gets pretty heavy, shed since the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. Whoa, you're going to put all that on us? So what these guys, what Christ is saying, what what these guys, what what these prophets, what they were all pointing to, which is me, all of this work, all of these prophets, all of them from A to Z, we're going to see in a minute, what all these prophets were pointing to, me, you are now leading the people to reject. You're going to be accountable. Verse 51, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah. So from A to Z, right? Actually from Genesis to Second Chronicles. Uh, by the way, in the Hebrew Bible, Second Chronicles was the last book. So from A to Z here, uh, who was killed, uh, Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the house of God. Yes, I tell you again, it shall be charged against this generation. Verse 52, Woe to you lawyers. Here comes Mark number 7. For you have taken away the key of knowledge. You yourselves did not enter. And here's the word. You hindered those who were entering. There's Mark number 7. You people are a barrier to God. You're not a door. You're a wall. Verse 53. When he left there... The scribes and the Pharisees began to be very hostile and to question him closely on many subjects, plotting against him to catch him in something he might say. And, of course, that's why they had him over for lunch in the first place. It's like this. The Sunday school teacher said to her class, Class, where is the holiest place on the planet Earth? And the little boy said, well, I... It's the church's parking lot. And the Sunday school teacher said, well, what do you mean it's the church's parking lot? And he said, well, you know, it's kind of weird. You know, mom and dad, they, uh, you know, they get in the car and they're yelling and screaming at each other and they're all upset. And as soon as we pull in the church parking lot, it's the transformation that takes place. I mean, they're nice. They smile. They're jovial with one another. And so I, I just figure it's the parking lot. I mean, there must be something. There must be some kind of power. It's pretty cool. You should see it. Now, Jeff Foxworthy, funny guy, right? He's got his trademark program. You might be a redneck if we know that, right? I, I, I have discovered he even has a set for us Michiganders. You know, if... 
you are wearing a, a T-shirt and shorts in December. You just might be from Michigan and all of this stuff. But, but I am certain if he were ever to run that program for you might be a Pharisee, it would be drawn from this text here in Luke chapter 11. And what he would say would be this. If you are using men's standards rather than the Bible, if you are focused on the outward, if you are wrapped up in the insignificant, if you desire the attention of others, if you are infecting others, if you are making the lives of others harder, if in fact you are a barrier to God, well then, my friend, you just might be a Pharisee. Now, very important that you get what I'm about to say. Understand that this is not a drive-by guilting that the Word of God is doing here. This is not a drive-by guilting on the part of the Scripture. Christ is not seeking to condemn you by having you read this account of his exchange with these very, very hardened men. But rather, what the Lord has for you and I in all of this is conviction, a, a, a kind of invitation to just live better. He has a better way for you and I. He, he has a desire to lead us not to the grave like these guys do here, but to usher us into a kind of joy and, and a kind of delight, to usher us into life. And that abundantly are you tracking. So in order to do that, there are things that the Lord must root out of you and I from time to time. Understand that he, he, he deeply desires to, to free us from, from the soul crushing hypocrisy of religion. And so as the Lord, so as we ask the Lord to search our hearts this week for any of these stains of hypocrisy, and that's what they are. They are stains. It's like spilling wine, man. You, you spill out that hypocrisy. It is hard to get it out, all right? And so as we ask the Lord to search our hearts for any of these stains of hypocrisy, it is very important, critical that you and I understand the difference between condemnation Condemnation and conviction. We're in a very tough section of Scripture here, and so I think it makes sense to land the plane this way, and I hope you find this very helpful. Uh, let's take a look at this. I've also printed this on the back of your study guides, so you don't have to uh, take notes like a pack mule here. Uh, you can take this home with you. Um, but let's take a look uh, at this. Uh, these things in this table here kind of compare and contrast some very basic truth about the nature of condemnation versus conviction here uh, that this might, I, I pray, aid you uh, in discerning the difference. We have a whole lot of voices coming at us, don't we? You know, you got the Lord, you've got the enemy. You've got your own stinking flesh, all right? You've got friends and family. You've got all these voices. I mean, it can be difficult. So let's look at this. Let's walk through it. And then after that, I want to show you in, in reality, what does this sound like? I mean, what does this really look like? So let's take a look at this. Condemnation always comes from the enemy, right? Condemnation, those are lies. Conviction comes from God. It's the truth. Condemnation always leads you away from Christ, away from God. Conviction will always draw you near. Well, I can't pray. Condemnation, right? Condemnation always leads one to a, a place of confusion. I don't know what to do with this. I, I can't go to church. I mean, what? I, I, I got to straight... I, Conviction brings clarity. Condemnation always tears down and mocks and belittles and, and dwells and lingers. Sin will take you where you don't want to go and keep you there longer than you want to stay. Condemnation tears you down and mocks you, and, and it wants to dwell and keep you. Conviction builds up and affirms, and you... Uh, you uh, I died for this. You offer the broken moment to me and you move on down the road. Lest you suggest the cross was insufficient. 
Condemnation holds you captive. Conviction sets you free. Pray over this table this week. Here's what this sounds like. See if you recognize any of these. Condemnation says, you're an idiot. You're a loser. I can't believe you did it again. The accuser of the brethren, right? Conviction says, all right, yeah, you blew this one, but you know what? You're forgiven. It's what I died for. When you blow it, you just use that opportunity to look at the cross. Condemnation says, you're an idiot. You're a loser, and you're going to do it again and again. There is no, you are a hopeless basket case. Conviction says, look, I love you so much. You don't have to do this. You will get past this. Don't dwell on it. You just lean on me. Press into me. I got this. It's what the Apostle Paul told the Romans when he said, you don't have to be slaves to to sin. You are are now a slave of righteousness. That's what he's talking about. Condemnation says, you're in no shape to go to church. You better sit this one out. And no, you cannot and should not pray right now. How dare you go to God after you just did this? Seriously? Recognize that one? Conviction says, look, I love you so much. And I understand the flawed machinery you're working with, all right? But now is the very best time to come to me. You just confess and you repent. Here is my hand. Take it. I want to lift you up. Come. I have a better way. Condemnation essentially always says you're an idiot You're a loser. You will always be an idiot and a loser. And you are toast. You're never going to change. Conviction says, you are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter. I have better for you. Behold, I make all things new. You're going to crush it. Let's pray. Father, thank you time and time again when we go to your word. You pursue us, even having saved us, even being so patient with our getting off the rails. God, you pursue us. You are, your spirit is the hound of heaven. Thank you, God, that you keep coming after us. Would you help us this week? not to live these hypocritical lives. Would you help us to see where in our hearts that, that, that this, this might be kind of dwelling and lingering in God? Would you help us to identify that, that we might live for your glory and advance your kingdom and not push people away? Particularly in this season, help us to be sensitive. And God, I pray that when we go to your word this week, next week, as we're in these tough sections of Scripture, God, I pray that you would lead our hearts to to understand there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. That God, you are lifting us up. You are extending your hand. You have a better way for us. You just love us so much. You want us to come in to the fullness of what it is you created us for. Help us receive your word with beautiful, sweet, inviting conviction. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen.